Hi, my name is Aaron Lacey, and you're listening to the proposed Borrower Defense Framework, which is the first webinar in our four-part series unraveling the proposed Borrower Defense Rule. Um, these originally took place between August and September of 2016. This is a re-recording. Um, the content, the slides, everything are exactly the same as what was presented initially in the live version. Uh, we just weren't happy with the audio quality in the original version, so we decided to go back and do a second take. I mentioned my name is Aaron Lacey. I'm a partner in the higher education practice here at Thompson Coburn. Uh, Thompson Coburn is a law firm based in St. Louis, Missouri, with locations around the country, um, about 400 attorneys, so a pretty large operation. And we are lawyers, uh, and I also am an attorney that practices here with the firm. Um, our higher education practice does a number of things. I like to divide it into typically about three different buckets, um, at least the portion of the practice um, that I uh, am most involved in, the regulatory portion. Uh, we provide regulatory counsel to schools and institutions on federal, state, and accrediting agency laws and standards. So that would be things like Title IV, Title IX, uh, gainful employment, consumer information, uh, things along those lines, including proposed rules, in this case, by the Department of Education. So all those things that sort of under the umbrella of the Higher Education Act. Uh, and, and or related. Um, we also assist institutions with a wide range of uh, post-secondary transactions, contract drafting and negotiation, policy creation and compliance systems design. So, for example, someone might want to design a, uh, a, a Title IX compliance system and that would incorporate training and uh, all different types of policies and things along those lines and we would help somebody put all that together. Um, and finally, we represent institutions in a number of different capacities, student and employee litigation, uh, government investigations, attorney general investigations, uh, and administrative proceedings. So you might have, for example, a Department of Education program review uh, and have some issue that arises in the context of that program review, and we might help you out. Uh, before I was with Thompson Coburn, I was in-house uh, for uh, a period with a post-secondary institution that had multiple campuses uh, and also an online division. So I've been on the other side of, of this uh, uh, webinar and have a, a good sense as to the challenges that arise when you are trying to understand a complex regulatory proposal uh, like the one we're talking about today, and then to go the next step and figure out how it's going to impact your institution and how you might operationalize the different requirements coming down the pipe. Um, prior to that, I was an attorney in a post-secondary education practice in a law firm in Washington, D.C. for quite some time. So here's our webinar series schedule. There are four in the series. This is, I mentioned earlier, a re-recording of the first in the series. The original version took place live on October. August 24th, 2016, and today we're focused on the proposed borrower defense framework, which is one piece of this rulemaking package. Uh, you can see here on the screen the other three sessions uh, that took place in August and then later in September. The outline of the presentation, I want to start by talking a little bit about the rulemaking uh, and then get into the current borrower defense framework because there are existing rules that speak on this topic. And then we'll talk about the proposed borrower defense framework. So what is it that the Department of Education is suggesting that they would do differently? And finally, at the end, as always, uh, if you've tuned in our webinars before, we like to include just a couple of three slides relating to uh, potential resources. So let's start with the borrower defense rulemaking. Why, why is this happening? Um, prior to 2015, the Department of Education had only received five uh, defense to repayment or borrower defense to repayment claims over the course of about 20 years. So on five occasions, the department had attempted to recover uh, loan amounts outstanding from individuals, and they had asserted uh, a defense against uh, having to pay that, uh, those amounts to the department. Then the collapse of uh, Corinthian College Group occurred um, a couple of years ago, and as of June 24, 2016, 26,603 borrower defense claims have been filed. So, so you can see things change pretty radically. There's a little bit of an uptick there. Um, and significantly, in connection with those claims, the department has discharged a little north of $73 million uh, as a consequence of those borrower defense claims, at, with an additional 97 plus million discharged uh, on the basis of closed school discharge. So you can see the dollars are big. Um, the administrative picture has changed dramatically for the Department of Education, and, and so the department determined, you know, this is a new, a new playing field and we've got to come up with some new rules for the game. 
the rulemaking began essentially late in uh, 2015 when the department announced that it was going to engage in a negotiated rulemaking process. Uh, and then between January and March of 2016, uh, the department put together some negotiated rulemaking panels. That's sort of a group of people that includes stakeholders from different aspects uh, of the industry, some from inside higher education, consumer advocates, and others. And they met on three separate occasions to discuss what the new rules might look like. Um, the objective when the department goes through this type of negotiated rulemaking in a perfect world would be that at the end of the third session there would be consensus or general agreement as to what the rules should look like. Uh, in this case there was not and I don't, I don't think that people really expected that there would be because the folks at the table doing the negotiating came to the table with very differing views on what the rules should look like. So what happens when you don't have consensus at the end of the process? The Department of Education is essentially free to craft the rules um, in the way that it sees fit uh, and that it thinks would be in the best interest of the uh, taxpayers and others. So that's what the department has done. On June 16th, it published in the Federal Register the proposed rules that it put together. And it invited the public to review those rules and offer comments. Uh, the comment deadline was August 1st. Uh, so that was earlier this year in 2016. Um, and our expectation is at this period, uh, the department is reviewing all the comments that were submitted. There were uh, north of about 10,500 comments. Um, many of those will be short, one or two or even three paragraph comments, but there will also be very long, sophisticated legal analyses submitted by associations and schools and council for other institutions. Um, we participated in that comment process actually and provided some uh, ourselves. So the reason we wanted to go ahead and do this uh, uh, webinar series on the proposed rules is we felt that there was still opportunity between August and November 1 when we think the final rule will likely be published for institutions to engage, to understand the rule and potentially reach out to their associations uh, and or uh, even uh, reach out to their representatives directly. If you are listening to this prior to November 1st, 2016, uh, keep in mind you may still have a chance to reach out and make your voice heard if, if you think there are aspects of this rule that uh, should be changed, or at least the proposed rule that should be changed. We do expect either October 31st or November 1st that you will see the department publish the final rule. Uh, the department has to publish a rule by November 1st of a given year if they want it to become effective by July 1 of the following year. So it is very common to see large regulatory packages from the department published either on the 31st of October or the following day. Assuming the department is able to get the final rule published by November 1st, then that rule would become effective July 1 of 2017 that is next year. So the purpose of this slide is to sort of give you a sense of uh, the different types from a topical perspective, the different types of um, things that have been addressed in this rulemaking. It is generally being referred to as the bar defense rulemaking, and that certainly is the headliner, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. But it is important to note that the proposed rules touch on a number of different subjects, not just the proposed bar defense framework. And that includes financial responsibility triggers, arbitration agreements, uh, closed school and false certification discharge, and misrepresentation. And of all of these topics, the only topic proposed that is truly exclusive to proprietary schools are the new repayment rates that the department has proposed. Everything else ostensibly also applies to public and private nonprofit institutions. Now, in some cases, the way the rule is designed, it is unlikely that it would be an issue for or really have an impact on private nonprofit or public institutions. But even that is fairly limited. There is a great deal of this rule that affects all of higher education, uh, and we certainly have been trying to reach out to our private nonprofit and public clients to make sure that they are aware of this rule and, and considering its implications. So let's talk about the current borrower defense framework. Where are we now? You have to start uh, with the current rule to understand uh, the impact of the proposed changes. So in, in 1993, Congress created the direct loan program. You know, it used to all be FFEL. You got your student loans from private banks, and that was backed by a guarantee agency, and the guarantee agency was in turn backed by the Department of Ed. 
Um, and then in 1993, they decided to create a, a dual opportunity. So while the banks would still make loans, it, for the first time it became possible for individuals to get loans directly from uh, the U.S. Department of Education. And again, that was aptly named the Direct Loan Program. Now, the Direct Loan Program is the only type of student loan program that we have because the FFEL program has been completely retired. So as part of the direct loan legislation, that is the legislation that created the direct loan program, Congress directed that the secretary, meaning the secretary of the Department of Education, shall specify in regulations which acts or omissions of an institution of higher education a borrower may assert as a defense to repayment of a loan made under this part. Right? So the idea here is that, again, there would be some sort of proceeding and the Department of Education would be attempting to collect on a direct loan made to a borrower, and a borrower would assert or say, I don't have to repay this loan, or I shouldn't have to repay this loan, because the institution I attended engaged in some act or omission, and that should absolve me of the responsibility for repayment. So the following year, the Department of Education introduced at 34 CFR 685-206C, which is still there, the basic framework that exists today. And the process is more or less what you see here in this slide. The department would initiate a collection proceeding, the borrower would assert a defense against repayment, and the department would consider the defense, determine whether and to what extent it wanted to actually forgive any of the loan debt that was owed by the borrower, and then at the end, the department would have three years under the regulation to initiate a separate proceeding to recover that forgiven amount from the institution. So to be clear, if a borrower said, look, I have a $20,000 loan, I shouldn't have to repay it because my institution did X or Y, and the department said, okay, we've looked at what you've provided us, we agree, uh, you should not have to repay that $20,000, the department has this limited period of time under the law to turn around and then say, institution, we've, we've forgiven that $20,000, but you have to pay us back, because otherwise the taxpayer would just be out $20,000, right? So the, the regulation contemplated, even in its current form, contemplates the idea that the department could turn around and uh, at its discretion attempt to recover that amount it forgave from the institution that committed the act or omission that was the basis for the borrower defense. Under current law, a defense includes any act or omission of the school, so this is in that current regulation, any act or omission of the school attended by the student that would give rise to a cause of action against the school under applicable state law, right? So it doesn't mean that there was actually a judgment Right. Uh, it just means that when the student says there was some act or omission, the student would attempt to, or the borrower, would attempt to demonstrate that that act or omission would give rise to a cause of action under applicable state law. And that would probably mean the, the law of the state in which the school uh, exists and where the student was uh, in attendance. In 1995, the department published a notice of interpretation in the Federal Register, and it talked a little bit about its new regulation and this bar defense concept. And, and in that uh, notice of interpretation, the department added a, that the cause of action, not only must it give rise, um, uh, not only must the act or omission give rise to an action under applicable state law, but it also, that act or omission must directly relate to the loan or to the school's provision of educational services for which the loan was provided. So, in other words, the department was trying to, to acknowledge that there could be incidents that occur on a campus, right, and that would give rise to a cause of action under applicable state law, but that would not be a sufficient basis for a borrower defense claim. And the examples they gave were personal injury tort claims or actions based on allegations of sexual or racial harassment for example, um, and, the, and the thinking there was there are other uh, opportunities for individuals who uh, may have experienced one of these types of incidents to try to seek recovery, right? Uh, uh, and that would be through, um, through those state laws and through the state courts and elsewhere, but it's not an appropriate basis for a borrower defense claim. 
That having been said, uh, you can imagine that establishing um, that a cause of action relates to the school's provision of educational services is still a pretty low bar. Uh, most of what an institution would do and provide to a student while the student was enrolled would likely relate to its provision of educational services. With regard to timing under the current framework, a borrower can assert defense at any time without regard to when the underlying act or omission occurred. So ostensibly someone could have graduated and been out of school and paying on their loan for 10 years and then go into default and then the department would uh, proceed to try to collect. And at that point, they could uh, assert the borrower defense based on an act or omission that took place while they were enrolled. So there's no statute of limitation with regard to um, when the actual act or omission occurred. <laughs> now, again, there is a limitation, and this is the second bullet here, and we talked about this a moment ago, on uh, when the department or how long the department has to bring a secondary collection action against an institution. Again, it's they have three years from the borrower's last award year to initiate a proceeding. So if a student graduated uh, in the 10, 11, 11, 12 uh, award year, or the 11 or 12 award year, let's say, and that was their last award year, um, then you would have, you know, three years from that point if you're the Department of Education. So if the student waited 10 years to even assert the borrower defense, then the department would be foreclosed, even if they decided to forgive that loan, uh, they would be foreclosed from turning around and trying to recover from the institution. That's under current law. There is no discussion in the current law of the process the department would follow in a recovery action um, against a school, right? So let's say that uh, the department was able, they were within that three-year timeline and they did feel like um, they wanted to initiate a proceeding to recover from the institution. There's no discussion with regard to what that type of proceeding would look like. And there's no reference to subpart G, uh, which is where the, the portion of the regulation that currently details the process for fine limitation suspension termination proceedings, nor is there any reference to subpart H, which is the, um, the part of the regulations that talks about the, the proceedings and process um, for a program review or an audit finding. Um, however, it is worth noting that in 1995, the department acknowledged in the uh, notice of interpretation that schools, uh, in the context of a proceeding uh, of this nature, recovery action, would be entitled to due process, right? All right, so let's talk about the proposed borrower defense framework. We, we've talked a little bit about you know, why the department is doing this and what the rule looks like at present. Um, so let's, let's discuss where the department wants to take us. The first thing I'd like to ask you to do, um, just conceptually, is to sort of draw a line in your mind um, because the, uh, b between um, July 1, 2017, uh, before and, and after, um, the law, it, it, the way the department splits it up and thinks about it, they've created, uh, they've changed a little bit, but there's essentially a framework and certain standards that will apply if someone asserts a defense against having to repay a loan that was made before July 1, 2017. And there is a slightly different set of standards and framework that will apply um, if someone asserts a defense against having to repay a loan that was made after July 1, 2017. And obviously that's the effective date of these regulations. So this reflects what the department thinks it can do in terms of changing the laws it applies um, to loans made before that date uh, and changing the laws it applies to loans that are made after that date. But it's an important conceptual distinction when you're thinking about the sort of the framework and how all this is going to play out. It's useful to think about it in terms of um, loans made before July 1, 2017 and and loans made after that date. Okay, so let's start by talking about loans made before July 1, 2017. Now you see on this slide, I've got uh, six little boxes, right, or six rows, um, and these essentially represent the different components of the framework. So first we're thinking about the framework, again, as applied to loans made before July 1, 2017. So here you're dealing with the same definition of, of what constitutes a valid borrower defense. That did not change, and that's why the box is blue. Right, it still has to be a cause of action under state law, uh, and it still has to relate to a loan uh, or educational services provided by the institution for which the loan was provided. Um, there's still the same time limitation on asserting a defense, meaning that a borrower can still assert a defense at any time without regard to when the act or omission occurred. But the department has changed the law, and there is a new uh, individual claim process there is a new group 
claim process that would apply even to loans made before July 1, 2017, um, there is no longer a time limitation on recovery actions. So a moment ago I told you under current law, the department only has three years from the end of the student's last award year to try to recover from an institution. Um, that time limitation uh, is no longer in place, or it's proposed that it would be removed. And then there's, uh, the department has proposed some new methods for calculating relief. So in other words, if they decide that someone is entitled to some level of forgiveness, how do you decide how much? It, it can be up to the full amount of the loan, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and so the department said, well, we've got two or three different uh, proposals for how you might calculate the amount of relief. All right, so for loans made after July 1, 2017, um, the salient point here is you can see every box is orange, right? So everything is new. You've got new definitions of a borrower defense claim, so what is a valid claim in the first place? New time limitations for asserting a claim, um, and in this case there are very few limitations and they vary by nature of the claim. Uh, new individual claim process, a new group claim process, Again, no time limitations on recovery actions and new methods for calculating relief. So for loans made after July 2017, you've got essentially a brand new framework. So let's break this down and we're gonna go through the different components. We'll start with the proposed definition of a borrower defense claim uh, and we're gonna focus on uh, loans made after July 1, 2017. The department proposes that going forward, right, so for loans made after July 1, 2017, for an individual to successfully assert a borrower defense, right, the borrower defense claim uh, would be certified if the act or omission of the school relates to the loan or the educational services for which the loan was provided. So remember, that's the same standard that was already in that notice of interpretation, and here they've just formalized it uh, and put it into the law. So you got an act or omission uh, on the part of the school, the act or omission related to the loan, the student's loan, or the educational services for which the loan was provided, and one of these other three things also has to be satisfied. Uh, the act or omission was the basis for a judgment against the school, so for an actual judgment. Um, the act or omission was the basis for a breach of contract. Doesn't mean that there was a judgment in this case or there was an actual you know, determination made by anyone. Um, it just means that, that uh, it was a sufficient basis for a breach of contract. Or constituted a substantial misrepresentation. Right? So what that means is when the department is trying to make a determination as to whether or not someone has asserted a valid borrower defense claim, they're going to be looking to determine, one, if it related to the loan or the educational services for which the loan was provided, and two, whether it also satisfied one of these other three requirements, and they're going to be making that determination. The department would be under the proposed rule. So let's first talk about judgment. We'll walk through each one of those. Judgment, breach of contract, substantial misrepresentation, because those are new. Remember, under the old law, the key was that the act or omission had to give rise to a cause of action under state law, and that's been, um, in the case for loans af made after July 1, 2017, that's been replaced with these three new standards, judgment, breach of contract, substantial misrepresentation. So for judgment, the department would determine that the act or omission satisfied the judgment standard if uh, the act or omission was a non-default favorable con or, or led to a non-default favorable contested judgment based on state or federal law in a court or administrative tribunal of competent jurisdiction. Right? Um, there is no limitation on when a claim could be brought. Uh, so if someone is in year 19 of their 20-year uh, loan repayment, right, uh, or ostensibly even after that point, um, and uh, let's say they've repaid their entire loan, and they're able to go back and establish that there was some sort of judgment and that there was this act or omission that uh, resulted in this judgment, ostensibly under the proposed rule, they would have the ability to assert a borrower defense claim and uh, recover the money that they had already paid to the secretary. Breach of contract. So in this case, a breach of contract, a successful breach of contract uh, claim would include any act or omission um, that constituted a breach without regard to materiality, right? So any breach of a contract, whether it is material or not, it could be the basis of a sufficient borrower defense claim. 
Also very important to note, the department has made crystal clear, and this is a quote out of the, um, the preamble to the regulation, that a contract could include the proposed regulation. A contract could include an enrollment agreement and any school catalogs, bulletins, circulars, student handbooks, or school regulations. I would also emphasize once again that this is not a rule that only applies to proprietary institutions. So if you were a private nonprofit institution or a public institution, someone could try to assert, a borrower could try to assert a valid claim based on the idea that you somehow breached your contract with the student and they could claim that your catalog or a bulletin or a circulator, a circular was the contract, right? There is no limitation on claims to discharge future amounts owed, right? So as long as there is some amount still owed on the loan that the student's paying, uh, they can assert or attempt to assert that this breach of contract should entitle them to discharging those remaining amounts. There is a six-year limitation to claims uh, to discharge amounts already paid, right? So um, again, if you're in year 10, um, you have six years from the date of the breach to try to argue that you should be able to uh, uh, discharge some amount that you've already paid to the department. Substantial misrepresentation. This would include any substantial misrepresentation made by the school or any contractual partner. Again, there's no materiality standard, and the department has indicated that in order for a substantial misrepresentation to be the basis for a borrowed offense claim, the individual must show that they actually relied on the substantial misrepresentation. And the reason this is significant is because under just the general substantial misrepresentation regulations, in other words, there, there's another part of federal regulation that essentially says institutions are prohibited from engaging in a substantial misrepresentation, period. If you, if you do that, you ostensibly are in violation of your program participation agreement and federal law, and you could, uh, worst case scenario, be booted from the federal financial aid programs, right? The department could just act unilaterally uh, based strictly on the su substantial misrepresentation without regard to whether it's a borrowed offense or not, right? Um, in that case, there is no requirement of actual reliance. So a, a misrepresentation under federal law, the definition is fairly broad, and, and, uh, um, and the department is looking to tweak a little bit with this rulemaking. We're not talking about that today in this particular webinar, but, but they are looking to clarify that a, a misrepresentation could include a, uh, a, uh, a misleading statement that has a tendency um, to confuse, and it, under current law, the, that standard is to confuse or deceive. The department would change it to say a, mis, a substantial or a misrepresentation could include a misleading statement that has a tendency to confuse um, uh, in the context of the, the circumstances, the current circumstances. I'm paraphrasing, that's not the exact language, but they would take out that, that notion of dece uh, deception, that word deceive, and replace it with a tendency to confuse uh, in the in the current circumstances. But the salient point here is there's no uh, requirement of intent or willfulness. A misrepresentation occurs even if inadvertent, even if, if an institution mistakenly provides uh, inaccurate information, that could be considered uh, uh, um, a misleading statement and a misrepresentation. It becomes a substantial misrepresentation under federal law um, if uh, someone uh, did or could have reasonably relied on it, right, so uh, to their detriment. So in that case, again, there's no actual requirement that there be um, actual reliance, right? Someone could establish that an institution, say, mistakenly said something that was inaccurate and that they could have relied upon that to their detriment, and that would qualify as a substantial misrepresentation. There's no materiality requirement, and there's no requirement of actual reliance. So it's a pretty low threshold, right? I mean, an institution, again, could mistakenly engage in what under federal law is a substantial misrepresentation. Now, the department has said in guidance that when they're looking at whether or not something is a substantial misrepresentation, they will take into account um, whether there are signs of intentionality in the surrounding circumstances. Um, but the fact is, under the letter of the law, it, there is not a requirement of actual reliance. So here, uh, in the context of bar defense, the department has said, look, it has to be a substantial misrepresentation under that definition in the law, but taking it a step further, the student would actually have to, or the borrower would actually have to establish 
actual reliance. Again, there's no limitation on claims to discharge future amounts, so no time limitation. Um, and there is a six-year limitation from the date the misrepresentation was discovered on bar defense claims to discharge amounts already paid. So let's talk about some points of significant concern, and I'm sure some of them have already occurred to folks listening. Um, first of all, the proposed rule permits defense claims to be brought outside the context of a collection action and without regard to whether a borrower is able to make the loan payments. So what, I, what do I mean here? So initially, as conceived, a borrower defense occurred, and I mentioned this at the opening uh, when we were talking about the current rule. Uh, it's asserted, or the idea was it would be asserted in the context of a collection action. Right, and that's that seems to flow very much from the statutory language, but to have been supported by, you know, the '95 Notice of Interpretation and the original regulations promulgated by the department. Um, they even say at the outset of the regulations um, in a proceeding to collect on a loan. Right, so the idea was someone is not repaying their loan. The department looks to collect, initiates a proceeding, and an individual asserts a defense. One of the big differences here is that the department now contemplates that outside of a collection proceeding, uh, a, a borrower could, um, who is making payments on their loan, who has graduated and has a job and is gainfully employed, um, could nonetheless fill out essentially an application and make a claim that they should be eligible to discharge their loans. So that's a, that's a big difference, it's, uh, and it seems to depart um, somewhat from what was contemplated in the HEA and what was originally understood by the department. Um, the other concern is, uh, ostensibly, it also um, removes a barrier uh, to frivolous claims. And the idea there is just that um, under the current process, uh, essentially someone would have to decide to quit paying their loans for one reason or another, and then be willing to incur a collection proceeding on the part of the department before they would actually assert the defense, and so presumably m many people who are making good money and have graduated and are able to pay back their loans would not go down that road. But now, under the new framework conceived by the department or proposed by the department, it is much easier for someone to simply file a claim, to have their loans discharged, and they don't have to go through that process of stopping paying their loans and sort of that embarrassment, engaging with the department and having a collection proceeding initiated or any of those kinds of things. And so the thought is um, that that's going to make it potentially much easier for someone uh, to simply put in a claim and see if they're able to get traction with the department and potentially get their loans forgiven, whether there's really a, a good basis for it or, or not. Um, so the proposed rule exposes institutions potentially to recovery actions that would be barred under existing law. And this is another significant concern. I guess that's why it's on the slide, points of significant concern. You know, we mentioned under the current rule, uh, the department only has three years, right, to try to recover uh, against an institution. And this is, this is on loans that were made prior to July 1, 2017. And recall, one of the things the department is proposing to do is to remove that three-year limitation. What that means is, if you had a student who, who graduated, you know, let's say in 2000, um, and, and that individual um, borrowed, so these are loans that were made before July 1, 2017. At this point, and let's say they were on a 20-year repayment plan, so they're in year 16 or so of their repayment plan, right? Um, at this point, they would still be able to file a bar, or, or to make a borrower defense claim on the basis that uh, the institution did something or engaged in some act or mission that gives rise to cause of action under state law. But as of today, the department would be barred from uh, initiating a secondary proceeding against the institution to collect, even if they decided to forgive that loan. Um, because the current law doesn't allow them to do that, it's been w far more than three years since the, since the student's last award year, right? Because remember, the student was there in 2000. If the proposed rule becomes law, then effective July 2nd, 2017, right, even though the department today would be unable to initiate that recovery proceeding, effective July 2nd, 2017, they could do so because the limitation has been removed. So essentially the proposed rule, again, would expose institutions to recovery actions that are impossible today. Um, they would be revived and now be uh, available to the department. 
The proposed rule permits the department to adjudicate disputes between an institution and a student concerning traditional common law actions and defenses. So the, the concern here is a separation of powers concern, right? The, the idea is that the judiciary is uh, authorized and empowered uh, under our constitutional framework uh, to adjudicate disputes. Uh, and, and in particular, disputes concerning traditional common law issues like breach of contract and misrepresentation. And what the department here is doing is it's essentially putting itself under the proposed rule, it's putting itself into that role. Because remember, when a borrower asserts a defense, even though ostensibly it was supposed to happen in the context of a collection action between the borrower and the department, the department is really determining whether some act or omission constituted a, for example, breach of contract between the student and the school. Right, so you've got a contract between those two parties and the department is, is turning itself into the arbiter of that dispute. Um, and again, the concern is that that would be a violation of, of, of the separation of powers doctrine. The proposed rule does not include a materiality standard for breaches of contract. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and that seems like a real concern, particularly if the department is going to interpret contracts to include catalogs, circulars, bulletins, very broadly, all, all different kinds of things. Um, you know, the example I've, I've given in conversations with clients, you know, in my mind would be, for example, in your catalog or in a bulletin, you say tutoring is going to be available from two to four on Thursdays. And something happens, you can't get enough student help, your grad assistants don't show up, who knows. But for some reason, it's not available on Thursdays from two to four, right? Either it's not available at all or it has to be rescheduled to Wednesdays from you know three to five. Uh, and the student down the road claims that that's a breach of contract because it certainly relates to the educational services, right, provided by the institution. Uh, and the contract said that the services would be available, the tutoring services from two to four, and the institution did not provide that. Now, you know, you might argue immediately, and I would expect an institution would, this is not material in any way, but, but that's the point we're trying to make here is, in order to assert a valid claim, there simply has to be a breach of contract. It doesn't have to be material. And the department contemplates this issue in the, in the comments to the regulation, proposed regulation, and says, look, we're comfortable with our ability to grant relief commensurate to the injury to a borrower alleged under the breach of contract standard. But, but what that means, you know, my thought is and concern is, it means that you still have to go through this process. I mean, the, the student uh, or the borrower, I should say, uh, alleges the, uh, the claim, makes the claim and alleges that there was an act or omission, and then the department asks for evidence and the department uh, reviews the information provided by the student, has to engage the school, the school has to allocate time and resources to try to defend itself. Um, all where the underlying breach of contract is frivolous, right, and non-material. And if there were a higher standard than the law or a materiality threshold, presumably many would be deterred from even filing those claims in the first place. But here, if you're a student, it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, playing the lottery. Uh, you, you know you can put in a valid claim and maybe the department will tell you you're not entitled to anything, but who knows? Maybe the person reviewing the claim will determine that you are entitled to something and you'll, you'll at least get some of your money forgiven. Um, and the real question becomes if you're a borrower, why wouldn't you? At least, you know, as they say, running up the flagpole, see if anybody salutes. You know, just see if uh, see if you can get any of your loans forgiven. Uh, that doesn't seem like um, a good uh, 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 approach if you're trying to conserve taxpayer dollars and resources and things along those lines. So again, the concern is why not just include an actual materiality threshold? The proposed rule does not include a materiality standard either for substantial misrepresentation. So that's what I was speaking to earlier. An institution could make a mistake in its catalog, um, and if someone could show that they could have relied upon that uh, misstatement to their detriment and, and actually uh, relied on it, then they would be able to assert a valid claim. E even if the reliance the, was non-material, if the misstatement itself was non-material and the detriment was non-material. In other words, you don't have to show that while it was to your detriment that it really impacted you in any material way. All you have to show is that it was to your detriment and that you actually relied on it. Um, 
A borrower could establish a claim by providing evidence that the institution made a misrepresentation, even if by mistake. So we talked about that. But then the last bullet here I want to highlight, too, in the context of group claims, and we'll talk about the individual and group claim processes in a minute, but in the context of group claims, under the proposed rule, there would be a rebuttable presumption of actual reliance. So in that case, the department would just assume that the people in the group, the individuals that are part of the group, uh, actually relied on the misrepresentation. And again, um, in that case, it could just be a mistake and there doesn't even have to be a showing that anyone actually relied upon it. So let's talk about the individual claim process. So we were just talking about, you know, what, what is it that you would have to state or show in the way of evidence to establish that you have a valid borrower defense claim. Assuming that you actually provided that evidence and the department determined to, uh, to at least look at the borrower defense claim, how does the process play out? And, and how does it differ if you're an individual or if there's a group? So the individual claim process, the borrower submits the claim application to the department. And remember, that's different from what it looks like now, where you would actually have the department initiate a collection proceeding. Here, there's no uh, uh, collection proceeding prerequisite to the claim. Uh, a borrower can just submit a claim application. You can, you can get it off the website. Um, then the department grants forbearance or suspends collection immediately as soon as an application is filed. And this is all proposed, I should say. The department would designate staff to review the application. So I, I emphasize staff because you're not talking about an administrative law judge. You're just talking about some, uh, you know, a staff member at the Department of Education making this determination. The staff would notify the school that the claim had been filed. The staff would review the evidence, the records, and, and any school submission at their discretion. The staff uh, would identify to the borrower and maybe the school the relevant evidence that formed the basis of, of his or her determination. And then the staff individual uh, would issue a written decision to the borrower. Um, the department finally would initiate a separate recovery action against the school as applicable and at its discretion. All right, so a couple additional points, and we will talk about significant concerns in a minute here. But a borrower can request reconsideration at any time based on new evidence. And that is defined as evidence uh, uh, not previously provided and not identified in the final decision as evidence that was relied upon. So even if you are aware that an individual has filed a claim, this is under the proposed rule, and you provide some sort of submission or documentation, and the, and the staff member makes a ruling and says the borrower is not entitled to any recovery, um, there is nothing that would prevent the borrower from coming back a year later and saying, I have new relevant evidence. You did not see it before. You didn't rely upon it. Uh, and I would like you to reconsider. And, and there's nothing to prevent the department from saying, okay, and reconsidering. So, you know, it's sort of never closed. Um, uh, ostensibly, institutions would be exposed to ongoing um, determinations. Uh, the department also, on its own accord, um, may reopen a claim at any time to consider new evidence, right? So that, that doesn't necessarily even mean evidence provided by the department. I mean, by the borrower, if the department just came into from any source new evidence, it has the authority to reopen the claim. All right, points of significant concern. So the proposed rule does not require uh, that an independent, unbiased hearing official oversee the claim. Administrative law judges, and we work regularly with ALJs. I mentioned earlier one of the things we do is represent institutions in, in front of um, in program review, audit proceedings, things like that. Um, they are and are uh, generally considered, and, and, and it is an integral part of their role, they are uh, largely independent of the department. They are part of the Department of Education, it is true, but they are really seen as um, uh, independent arbiters. Um, so when you have a, 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 you're involved in a proceeding in front of an ALJ, the department will actually assign its own attorney, the school will have an attorney, and they will negotiate, and the ALJ is like a judge, right? In a, in a, in a trial type setting. Um, in this case, you're not talking about an impartial ALJ, you're talking about a staff member at the U.S. Department of Education making these determinations. And it's hard to know who that would be and how influenced they might be um, by the current administration and its views on certain matters. The proposed rule does not require the department to identify or supply to the school 
the documentation supplied by the borrower in support of the claim or to identify or supply the records the staff considers relevant to the borrower defense. So while an institution ostensibly would have an opportunity to provide some sort of documentation or to sound off uh, and offer its side of things, there's nothing requiring the department to provide the documentation upon which it's relying or that the, that the borrower has supplied, which obviously would, would put the institution at a significant disadvantage and is inconsistent with sort of the one of the more fundamental elements of due process, those two elements being notice and an opportunity to be heard. So in order to have due process, you have to know what the charges are against you and you should have an opportunity to respond to those charges. It is difficult to have sufficient notice of the charges against you if you have no opportunity to see the evidence that's been provided by the other side uh, and or upon which the uh, arbiter, in this case, the Department of Education staff member is relying. The proposed rule does not guarantee a school the opportunity to provide information to the department or a time frame for providing a response. So it contemplates that a school might do that, but there's nothing requiring the department um, to permit the school to submit a, a information um, and there's no type of time frame. So ostensibly the department could say, well, you have five days or you have three days or you have by close of business tomorrow. The proposed rule does not guarantee a school the opportunity to appear at any kind of hearing or again to respond in writing. Um, and the proposed rule does not require that the department notify the school in writing of its determination and the relief granted. So it does contemplate that the individual borrower will get some sort of written notice, uh, but a school could, in theory, be left in the dark. The proposed rule does not guarantee a school the right to request uh, that the department reconsider a borrower defense determination upon the identification of new evidence. So the borrower can request that, or the department can reopen based on new evidence that comes into its possession. Uh, but it does not, the, the rule does not contemplate nor guarantee schools that opportunity. Um, the proposed rule also does not contemplate a process for a recovery action. So to the extent it lays out a process for individual borrower claims, it all uh, regards um, the borrower's filing of the claim and the staff member's determination of whether or not to grant that borrower defense and the amount of relief to potentially grant the borrower. But assuming a staff member says, okay, I'm gonna forgive the $20,000, and then the department decides to initiate a collection action, there is nothing in the rule, still in the proposed rule, about what that collection action would look like, how it would be carried out, and what rights an institution might or might not have in the context of that collection action. So do you have the right to be represented? What type of notice are you gonna be provided? How long do you have to respond? What opportunity will you have to respond? Will there be a hearing? Will there be an appeal? None of that is contemplated. Uh, we just mentioned that. So the proposed rule does not contemplate any form of appeal. Um, and, and there are no limitation periods on when a borrower can assert defense for payment of future amounts owed, and there are no limitation periods for when the department can seek reimbursement from a school following a borrower's successful defense. So you may recall, you know, I mentioned that there are a couple of limitations on when a borrower can seek to have uh, uh, amounts um, discharge that have already been paid, right? So in the context of breaches of contract, it's six years from the breach and substantial misrepresentation, it's six years from uh, the date of the, the misrepresentation. But when you're talking about future amounts owed, there's no limitation. So a borrower could bring the claim at any point up to the point that they've paid everything back. Um, and there are no limitation periods at all in any context on when the department can turn around and seek to recover from the school. So let's talk about the proposed group claim process. That was all in the context or in the case of when a borrower brings an individual claim. So one individual asserts a borrower defense claim. The proposed rule also contemplates the department uh, on its own initiative uh, um, beginning a group claim action against the school or initiating a group claim action. So here's how it would work. The department would identify the group, first of all, and that's from any source. So theoretically, the department could be driving down the street and see a billboard on the side of the road and say, you know what, or see a commercial on TV 
and say, you know, we think that commercial, the way it's worded, constitutes a substantial misrepresentation. So we're going to say that everyone who enrolled at this institution during the period that this commercial was running on TV um, could, uh, uh, could have relied on this commercial and that misrepresentation in the commercial to their detriment. And remember, in the context of group claims based on substantial misrepresentation, there is a rebuttable presumption of actual reliance. So the department would say, uh, then we also will presume that all of those individuals uh, relied, actually relied uh, to their detriment on the misrepresentation made in that commercial. So we're going to certify all those individuals as a class. And then the department would designate a staff member, probably an attorney, uh, within the Department of Education uh, to represent that group. Um, the department would notify the borrowers and as practicable, the school. Then there would be a hearing official, and, and we assume that would be an administrative law judge at this point, but it's, it's worth noting that the regulation does not actually use the phrase administrative law judge, it does actually say hearing official. A hearing official would consider the evidence and argument from the staff and the school. So it's sort of like the department is saying we're certifying a class action uh, and we're designating an attorney within the department to represent the class and the school can designate their attorney and they're going to present their cases respectively in front of an administrative law judge. And then the ALJ or hearing official issues a written decision on both forgiveness and liability. And this is an important point I want to make. Recall in the context of the individual borrower claim process, the staff member only makes a determination as to whether or not to forgive some amount of the loan, right, for the borrower. And then there would be a subsequent proceeding during which, and we don't know anything about what that would look like, but we do know that the regs at least contemplate, the proposed regs contemplate a separate collection action, subsequent separate collection action against the institution. In the group claim process, there would be no subsequent collection action. The administrative law judge is simultaneously determining the amount to forgive and presumably that the institution must repay the department that same amount, right? So it's, it's really more like uh, a trial in that case, and there's a single judgment handed down, and, and not only uh, does the borrower, uh, is the borrower forgiven that amount, but um, the school is on the hook for repaying that amount. Both group members and the school would receive copies of the decision, and then either the staff, which would again be the department's attorney, or a school can appeal a decision to the secretary. Um, and there is uh, a little bit of an idea there of an appeal expressed in the proposed rule, and ultimately the secretary would issue a final decision. Again, a couple of important points. If relief for the group has been denied in full or in part, a borrower may still file an individual claim based on the exact same underlying act or omission. Th this is as you would imagine, and this shows up in our significant points of concern slides. I mean, this is this is um, troubling and surprising that that the department would enable someone when an administrative law judge has reviewed the facts and made a determination based on those facts that there is no basis for a borrower defense claim, that the proposed rule would still enable an individual borrower to turn around and not only bring the exact same claim a second time, but bring it in front of a staff member instead of an administrative law judge. And presumably, the staff member would not be bound by the decision of the administrative law judge. Otherwise, why would you allow the individual borrower to bring the claim in that context? Um, th this is baffling and would seem to be problematic for a number of reasons. And we'll be very interested to see if this particular piece um, makes it through into the final rule. Uh, the department can reopen a claim at any time to consider new evidence. Um, points of significant concern. So the proposed rule does not require the department to notify the school on the bases, uh, of the bases for the group's borrower defense, the initiation of the fact-finding process, or any procedure or timeline by which to request records and respond. All right, let me read that again. The proposed rule does not require the department to notify the school of the bases for the group's borrower defense, the initiation of the fact-finding process, or any procedure or timeline by which to request records and respond. The proposed rule 
simply indicates that the department will notify the school as practicable. Again, so there's, there's a clear due process concern here. Um, the proposed rule does not require the department to identify or provide to the school the documentation obtained by the department or otherwise supplied by borrowers in support of the claims or to identify or supply the records the department official considers relevant to the borrower defense. So again, there would seem um, it, problems insofar as the school is not really being supplied with sufficient notice. The proposed rule does not guarantee a school the opportunity to provide information to the department or specify a time frame for providing a response. The proposed rule does not guarantee a school the opportunity to appear at a hearing. Now, the, the Administrative Procedure Act and, and common law, I mean, the, to have sufficient due process um, in this context, it is probably true that the department would not have to actually provide someone an opportunity to appear in a hearing. Uh, I mean, that could be argued, but, um, but it, that is probably true. But even if you are not being given the opportunity to appear physically in front of someone in a hearing, uh, one would expect a guaranteed opportunity um, to make your case, right, to be heard, at least in writing. The proposed rule states that after reaching a determination with regard to a group bar defense claim, an institution may appeal, but the rule proposes no procedures for the governance of the appeal. The proposed rule does not guarantee a school the opportunity to submit information or require the department to review such information in connection with a hearing official's determination of the appropriate amount of relief to grant in a group claim. So let me help uh, decipher this a little bit. You've got the process by which the ALJ reviews, uh, the administrative law judge will review the facts and make a determination as to whether or not some uh, uh, level of forgiveness um, was permitted. But then there's this secondary determination that has to be made as to how much forgiveness is appropriate, right? Um, and that's, there's sort of an analogy to what occurs um, in, uh, in uh, trials where uh, there will be a determination on the facts and then sort of a secondary determination with regard to the amount, maybe of punitive damages, things like that. Um, and here the expectation would be that a school would have an opportunity uh, to sound off and be a part of that determination. So even if the ALJ had already made a decision that that there was some level of wrongdoing, um, the school would have an opportunity to offer evidence of mitigating circumstances, things of that nature, um, that might go to the amount of relief granted. And in fact, there's no opportunity to do that um, provided for in, in the regula proposed regulation. There are no limitation periods on when a borrower can assert defense for payment of future amounts owed, once again, and there are no limitation periods for when the department can seek reimbursement from a school following a borrower's successful defense. Um, a borrower would have the opportunity, and I mentioned this just a moment ago, to seek a more favorable judgment uh, or adjudication on a claim that's already been previously concluded. Um, and then finally, the department can reopen a claim at any time, once again, to consider new evidence. Right, so, I mean, in theory, under the proposed rule, you could uh, have the department bring a group claim, right, and, and the ALJ could decide against the borrower and say, you know, there's no sufficient evidence of a, of, a, of a valid borrower defense, and then that individual borrower could bring the exact same claim uh, on an individual basis and not as part of the group in front of a staff member. And if the staff member said, no, no, we don't, we don't, I don't think that there's a sufficient basis, then the borrower could turn around six months later and, and ask that it be reopened on the basis of new evidence and continue to do that every six months, if, if presuming the borrower could come up with some sort of evidence. But, but what it, it illustrates is that, you know, a borrower could get multiple chances um, at, at trying to establish a claim and, and get relief, uh, even if an institution has uh, successfully established um, two, three, four times over that, uh, that there really is no sufficient basis for a borrower defense. If nothing else, it just means that there's this, these administrative resources both within the department and on the part of an institution that are being expended over and over and over. All right, the last piece I wanna, I wanna touch on, because we're at an hour, uh, is proposed methods for calculating relief. And uh, you know, this isn't anything that you're probably gonna see a lot of discussion on in uh, the press or elsewhere, but there were a few things here that I thought were um, 
interesting to say the least, and I just wanted to highlight. So the proposed rule provides that the amount of relief will be calculated using one of several methods that are proposed uh, in the rule or such other method as the secretary may determine. So the, the first thing to note here is there's some flexibility in the process that the secretary will use to determine relief or the methods that will be used. And ostensibly, you could have some inconsistency because you could have different methods used from uh, instance to instance. The first method, and this is found in Appendix A to the proposed regulation, the, the, the department would look at the difference between what the borrower paid and what a reasonable borrower would have paid had the school made an accurate representation as to the issue that was the subject of a substantial misrepresentation underlying a claim. And, and the red text here illustrates my concern, and that is that these are squirrely, if not impossible, concepts that the department is, is proposing to use. Um, and it concerns me because when a standard is so difficult to understand or pin down, it really isn't a standard at all. Right. So when you're talking about the, deter uh, the department here would have to make some sort of determination as to, quote, what a reasonable borrower would have paid had the school made an accurate representation. And, I, you know, I just, it's hard for me to understand how they would even go about doing that. Right. I mean, are they valuing at that point your education? Um, and are they saying, well, if, if someone absent the substantial misrepresentation, a reasonable borrower would have paid the full amount? Or is it possible that they could conclude that even absent the substantial misrepresentation, a reasonable borrower would only pay, say, half of that amount um, for, for the education that you're offering? I mean, there just seems to be a lot of challenge here in administering this kind of standard. Um, the difference between, so this is the second method, the difference between the amount of financial charges the borrower could have reasonably believed the school was charging and the actual amount of financial charges made by the school for claims regarding the cost of a borrower's uh, program of study. I, mean, I guess this one is, of the three, um, a little easier to pin down um, because presumably uh, the amounts that you would be charging would show up in your catalog and an enrollment agreement if you have one on your website, places of that nature. So it would be a little easier to pin down what a borrower could have reason to believe the school was charging. Um, but still, you've got the department making a determination as <clears throat> to what someone could or could not reasonably have believed, um, which is a squirrely concept. But in my mind, without question, the most problematic of the three here is, is this third method. So the department, in trying to determine an appropriate amount of relief, would look at the total amount of the borrower's economic loss less the value of the benefit, if any, of the education obtained by the student. So what you have here is the department suggesting that it is, it is actually going to evaluate and, and put a dollar a quantitative, you know, quantitative dollar figure, a, a, a worth uh, to your education, the educational product that you offer as an institution. You know, and I think there are real concerns, first of all, is how, how on earth would you go about doing that? Um, how do you determine the worth of an English degree offered by a state university versus an HVAC degree offered by a career school, you know, um, versus an engineering degree offered by a private nonprofit? Right? Um, they are all vastly different. These are different kinds of educational experiences. You have institutions with different missions. Um, and let's just assume for the moment that all three of those institutions are superb, top of class, and that in every case the education is as good as it could possibly be. There's still the question of how do you go about valuing those educations and comparing one to another. Even more interesting is how is the department going to value an English degree from a state university against an English degree from a private nonprofit or an English degree from an elite private nonprofit versus an English degree from a community college, All right? It seems like there would be a lot of room um, for political influence here potentially, um, for swings from one administration to the next or inconsistency even among staff. But, but at, at bottom, the biggest concern is just the idea that you have the Department of Education making a determination as to the value of the education that you offer. Um, I think that is uh, 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 
potentially troubling, and I'll be very interested to see. I know a lot of folks commented on that and be very interested to see how the department responds to those comments and whether this uh, continues to be present in the final rule. Um, I should note, the value of the benefit of the education is defined by the department. They've attempted to define it, not exhaustively, this is just a, a, a by way of example, but they note they might look at the transferability of credits uh, or look at certain the success of certain gainful employment programs. Certainly this suggests that they are thinking about for-profit institutions. Right, because it is typically nationally accredited career schools, for-profit institutions um, that have the greatest challenges with transferability of credit and certainly that offer the greatest percentage of gainful employment programs. Uh, but I want to emphasize to the public and private nonprofit institutions that might be listening to this recording that there is absolutely nothing that would prevent the department from applying this same analysis to a bar defense claim made against a private nonprofit or public institution. Um, and in fact, in this case, because the only real examples they give about the value, making this value judgment primarily apply to career and proprietary institutions, it, it just leaves a big question mark as to how they might go about valuing the education offered by um, traditional or more traditional type institutions of higher ed. All right, so TC resources. Uh, in this case, we, we don't have a lot that we've published yet as we had in the case of gainful employment. We do plan on putting some things out in the coming months. But um, we certainly encourage folks to listen to the other presentations in this series. It is presently our intent uh, to do another webinar series uh, after the final rule is published, looking more specifically at the final rule. Uh, and we always uh, encourage and are delighted when folks uh, go to our higher education blog, Regucation, uh, where we write about all different kinds of topics, including um, proposed regulations. Uh, and that's me, and we'll leave this slide up. Um, in case you want to give me a holler, I'm always happy to chat with folks uh, about anything relating to higher ed, but certainly about things like this, um, proposed regulations and final rules and whatnot. Again, my name is Aaron Lacey. Very much appreciate you tuning in. Hope you'll listen to the other sessions in the webinar series. Uh, be well and uh, see you soon.